If you are a fan of softball, you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show. From softballjunk.com, we're bringing you more softball than anyone on the planet. Sit back and get ready. Here's the Fast Pitch TV show. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Fast Pitch TV show. I'm your host, Gary Leland, and I upload new episodes of this show on the 1st and 15th of every month. So make sure you come back and check out future shows. Now this week I have an interview with former Olympic softball great Jennifer McFalls. But before that starts, please watch this short video about my softball magazine, which you can find at fastpitchmagazine.com. Oops, sorry. I was reading this month's issue of the Fast Pitch Magazine. What? You're not familiar with the Fast Pitch Magazine? Watch this. You are going to love it. Great, right? Want to find more about the number one coaching tool on the internet? Go to fastpitchmagazine.com today. Appreciate you coming on the show. And I want to go back and talk about uh, starting with your youth. How old were you when you started playing? Who was your first coach? Um, tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh, gosh. I probably started playing when I was about eight and under, you know, uh, started off trying to pitch, do every position on the field. But, um, you know, of course, when I first started getting involved in softball, a lot of my family was involved in the game. So just grew up watching them play and, uh, you know, had the the opportunity to have my dad as a coach at one time early in my career. And, uh, you know, just really a lot of influence from my family at home. And then, you know, just uh, great opportunity to play in a, in a good organization in Grand Prairie, Texas, um, and then moved on to, you know, the more metro uh, competitive leagues in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, by the time I graduated in high school, I was playing for a team out of Fort Worth that, uh, well, I mean, actually most of our girls were from the Grand Prairie, Dallas-Fort Worth area, so uh, we were called the Everman Shadows out of the Fort Worth uh, area, and uh, really just had an outstanding group of young ladies that went on to play at the next level. So it was, you know, by the time I got into high school, we we had a really solid uh, foundation and solid program, and and young girls that really had aspirations of playing at the next level. So being from Grand Prairie, were you a gopher or a warrior? <laughs> I was a warrior. Mm-hmm. I was a warrior. Yeah, they had a lot of good teams coming through that school there, and a lot of good talent. So what was your high school career like? What was it like playing in high school? Well. The funny thing is I actually didn't have softball in high school. I was a multi-sport athlete, so I played uh, volleyball, basketball, soccer, uh, did everything but softball in high school and, you know, middle school growing up. And, uh, you know, to be real honest, I didn't realize softball was going to be my avenue until about my junior year of high school. So, and there was not, there was no softball in high school. You didn't have a softball team. Did no. So things have changed a lot, uh, haven't they? <laughs> things have changed a lot. Um, you know, when I uh, went off to school, when I was, I believe it was like my senior year in college, that uh, they actually started softball in the high school level. And the crazy thing about it is we had so many girls playing at that time that I played with on my volleyball, my basketball team, but we all played, you know, summer travel ball softball together. So um, just a, a really great group of, of athletes that, we all played together outside of school. We all played together, you know, volleyball, basketball, soccer in school. And, um, you know, it just it would have been amazing had we had had a softball team at that time in high school. I, I certainly feel like, you know, at our high school, we would have gone pretty far. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would. I'm sure there was some talent. Um, so you played in college? And so um, I guess they didn't, did they scout the teams back then like they do now and sign them? Not as early, I'm sure. And what was that like uh, at a time when they didn't even have softball? Because that's kind of a different time, you know, is what I'm saying, when they didn't have softball in high school. You know, um, 
I played for a team that was competitive enough that had other players a little bit older than me that were getting looked at by uh, colleges. And uh, so playing with the Everman Shadows, uh, I played with a young lady that was a year ahead of me named Charlotte Cannon from Arlington. She was a pitcher, and she had committed to Texas A&M. So about my sophomore year in high school, uh, I was at a practice one night, and Coach Brock from Texas A&M came over to watch Charlotte practice and uh, you know at the end of the practice he grabbed me after and my dad and had a conversation with me about coming to Texas A&M and you know and things just sort of escalated from there so um, yeah you know we just really got recruited in the summer uh, and then you know just the whole funny saying of you never really know who's watching and I just things just sort of landed in my lap at the right time um, you know I had I re had a pretty good summer career and uh, I guess it was after my sophomore year in high school that I really started to get some good looks from some colleges and um, at that time I started you know thinking that softball was going to be my ticket to the next level and it was. And I had to ask Amanda this I'm going to ask you what's it like being an Aggie at UT? Well, you know, I am very, very blessed and thankful to have my degree from Texas A&M. Uh, it was a great school for me to go to attend, um, a great fit for me personally, my family, um, you know, the tr traditions. I will always have maroon blood in me, but, you know, I, things happen, life happens, and, and, you know, growing up in Texas, I've always been a Longhorn fan as well. So um, being able to have both of those schools in my life at this time is it's just really, really amazing to me and, and to my family. So, you know, um, after moving on of my, high, of my college career at Texas A&M and having the opportunity to actually get a paycheck from the University of Texas and coach at this level and uh, work with Connie Clark, it's, it's just a blessing for me. So, And then we went on to, I guess, what is the top of the pyramid, I guess we could call it, in softball as far as being a player. You made it to the Olympics. And uh, first Olympics, correct? Yes. And well, I was an alternate in 96 okay. for the 96 games in Atlanta, and then I actually played in the 2000 games in Sydney. Okay, so you've had a lot of experience there being with the whole deal. What was that like in the 96, just being there, part of the team, going to the first Olympics in softball, seeing Dot Richardson hit the first home run ever in softball, and having that group of just talented people as uh, your teammates? You know, I was. Uh, it was such a learning experience, another phase in my life where when I was in college, just didn't realize that I was going to have the opportunity to continue to play for another four years or eight years at that point. Um, and it was it was actually my junior year in college when my coach said, hey, you're going to try out for the Olympic team? And I thought, I don't know, I'm going to have that opportunity. And sure enough, I did. You know, I graduated from Texas A&M, finished up my career in 94, and uh, it just really it landed at the right time getting invited to uh, the USA first tryouts ever and you know when I first went to the first tryout I was I think I was number 226 or something like that out of all the girls that were getting the opportunity to try out and uh, you know as the days went on I just continued to stay in the process and before I knew it I'd had opportunity to be a part of you know like their top 30 athletes that they had picked to go represent the USA in some events and uh, you know from that point it just became another phase in my life where another door opened because of softball and uh, just you know a whole, my whole life just changed at that point you know started thinking about the opportunity really of having you know t to get to play with some of the pioneers of the game you know playing behind the legends of the game like Dot Richardson uh, playing with Michelle Smith Lisa Fernandez um, you know and, and so every day that I had that opportunity to step on the field with those young ladies in practice I took it as an opportunity to get better and just learn and uh, and at that point you know going being an alternate on the 96 team um, you know I just I try to be a sponge every day learn everything I could and just sit back and watch and you know and I, it became a dream of mine at that point to really find a way to make the 2000 Olympic team and you know after the 96 games um, you know the experience alone is just it's something you can never I can't explain it I can't replace it I mean you just dream of it and uh, and from that point on uh, you know I think my work ethic got a little bit better I got more committed more disciplined in my personal life as far as wanting to compete then at that point and represent the United States in the 2000 games and uh, and my dream came true and so from 90, 96 on I was on the national team every year and got a chance to play in the Pan American games the uh, world championship game so I have gold medals from those events and then you know just stepping on the field in Sydney Australia and wearing USA across your chest is 
It's something you, can, you can't explain. It's amazing. I'm sure it is. Now, this is a question I get all kinds of answers on. Where are your gold medals right now? <laughs> you probably will laugh because it's in a mind or a drawer home. <laughs> I've, I've had every answer you can come up with on those. Yes, days. I have been through the gamut. I, you know, uh, for a long time I just kept it in a drawer because, you know, I didn't really want it. People would say, why don't you put it in a safety deposit box or put it That's up one somewhere. of the answers I get sometimes. You know, and I could, but then, you know... If somebody asks me for, to see it, I want to be able to run in there and grab it and show them. So, um, you know, I've had it in a, a nice um, storage cabinet, you know, area at home that I've had it displayed in a little curio cabinet with some of my, you know, my other medals and things like that that were really significant. So I've had it out and on display, but I'm in a little bit in transition right now with moving and figuring out where, you know, settling in in Austin and all that, so, but I have it close and, and, <laughs> and I, I would say it's safe, so. <laughs> you can get to it at any time. I can get to it, yes. That's funny. Now, I want to ask you, because there are a lot of kids playing softball now, I mean, a ton of them, and you know, I, we were talking about that pyramid a second ago. That pyramid is all those kids that are eight years old, it's pretty base, but then when you get up to the top of the pyramid, it's pretty tiny up there. What piece of advice would you give the kids that are trying to get to that piece, that the top of that pyramid? Just a tip, you know, nothing that's uh, just something you're saying, hey, this is something that I know that will uh, help you out. Well, I think you can never stop learning. And, you know, really it, it, what you do lies in your own hands as far as what your work ethic is and your commitment level is. Uh, you know, we go out recruiting every day, and I am looking for, as I'm sitting in the stands as a coach, a player number one that uh, is really fun to watch. She's got she's got a great uh, chemistry with her team. She you can obviously tell she's a great team player. She's having fun and she's extremely passionate about what she's doing on the field. And uh, and you know, last but not least, her work ethic is unbelievable because I feel like if you don't have a cap on what how hard you're willing to work, the sky's the limit. And, um, you know, if you want to make it to the top, you've got to be able to be strong academically. You've got to be able to be strong in, in the character on and off the field. And your work ethic, your time management, your commitment level has, has got to be unstoppable. And if someone was, you're saying that you, you go out and see players, scouting players, if someone wanted to play for UT, you know, not using this as a promotion, but if someone said, hey, I wish I could get seen, mm -hmm. you know, what would be the way that they would say, this is a way that you have a chance of being seen, you know, because you can't go everywhere in the United States and see every kid that wants to, like, be seen. And I'm sure there are a ton of kids that you'd want to play for, but you just never could see them because of the time. What would be a piece of advice there? Well, you know, for a long time it was about make sure you email the coach, get something. Now it's almost we get so many of those, you, they kind of get lost in the shuffle sometimes. So the best way would be to find a way to get to our campus and get to a, a camp. So that because we we work our camps and that's the one time we can start to build a relationship with those players and get to know them because that's the first step in the process is we want to be able to recruit a kid number one that wants to be at Texas and number two that we have built a relationship with and we we like it's a business it's a partnership you know um, and so we get to see all those intangibles at a at a camp you know whether it's a one day or two or three day situation um, but that is the one place that we actually get to spend a little bit of quality time with especially with the early recruiting otherwise we show up at the field and they're playing and that's great we, we need to go see them play and we will once we identify them but it takes some time initially to s sort of build that relationship get to know them put a name with a face and then we go out and, and watch them compete I want to ask you on the same basis about college exposure tournaments just in general there's so many of those now what are the odds of a team getting into a hundred team tournament exposure tournament and you seeing a player and signing him at that tournament what are the odds of that happening uh pretty slim that's, that's what yeah, i mean pretty I, slim I think everybody I mean, thinks they're going to go out there and there's all these coaches ready to sign them and i think you have people you've gone to see you've done your homework and you're going out there to work you're not going out there just watch a game and hope that one kid comes on the field and go oh my lord you know every once in a while you get awed by you know by a player you you walk away and you're just amazed and and you know, generally we go to exposure camps and our, our hope is to walk away with a, a list of kids that we would go back and start the research on. Um, you know, we, we never actually walk up to a field after a tournament or a game and, and make an offer right then and in there because it is a business, you know, deal. And it's a long-time commitment for us, so we've got to do homework. We've got to go back and, 
and research that kid and find out what her day-to-day -day life is like. Um, you know, we, we don't only just watch them compete on the field. We want to know what they are like in high school. We want to know what their relationships are like with their teammates. And so we start that process and start to identify them. But, you know, when we leave a showcase, we, you know, ideally is to walk away with a, you know, list of five to ten kids that we can just, you know, start to, I guess, tap into and start to research a little bit. So you've got to make sure they're not poisoned in the dugout, even though they're talented, all of a sudden your whole team breaks. There's a lot to this. There's a lot, and that can happen, you know, and you, that's why it takes the early recruiting is a little bit scary because you are identifying kids at such a young age. That was my next thing I was going to ask. And, I mean, this yeah. is so young now. In three, four years, it could be a whole different person. You know, and, and unfortunately for them, there's pressure on them to make a, an early commitment. And then for us, there's pressure on us to identify those kids and put those offers out there. Then the next process, the phase of that is to really watch them grow over the next three or four years. You know, and, and unfortunately, uh, really it's the deal's not finalized until they sign, which is their senior year of high school. So if those kids, I guess, at some point start to taper off or quit, you know, their work ethic sort of falls short, um, maybe they do some things from a character standpoint that we don't, we don't really love, or academically they're not getting it done. You know, it could be a situation that we would pull off of a of an offer, but you know, because those kids still have to hold up to their end of the deal as well. We don't want that to have to happen. We, you know, because when we put that offer out there, we're hoping we get to watch these kids really grow and become those great players that we're hoping. Um, but they still have to fulfill their end of the deal. Do teams nowadays? And I'm not trying to peg this on you, but do teams and coaches and staffs nowadays, um, if you have interested players that you're interested, check their social media to see what they're up to. And then if you're going, because I do that at my business. We I do. have people come in all the time hunting for jobs. I go on there and they, they show themselves with pot right. or something. I'm going, I can't right. hire this person. This is, and it's not smart enough even to put that on our page. <laughs> so, and so do you yeah. all check that out and say, and sometimes you go, well, this person we were interested in, but obviously we're not interested in it. No doubt. It's, it's one of the first things we do is check that. We, we check our players. Uh, you know, we, we've brainwashed our players so much. We've talked about it so much about the pros and cons of social media and, you know, that it can just absolutely destroy their lives, their careers. If, it's there forever. If, right. It you, doesn't go away. You so, can't take it down. Even though you, know, you think you take it down, it's still out there in cyber world. And that's part of that teaching process with our young athletes. I mean, the hard part is with the NCAA rules, you know, we can't really communicate with them on a day-to-day -day basis. We can only talk to them if they call us. So it is a little bit challenging to try to monitor it all the time, but we we have to get a handle on it and we have to really start to develop that relationship with them so we can identify that because that's definitely some things that could jeopardize you know once they say yes I'm ready to be a Longhorn they're representing our university and they're representing us and so we've got to make sure that you know their standards meet ours. That makes a lot of sense. I got one last question for you. You have played you know at the top of the game you've coached at the top of the game I mean in travel ball you've, you've done everything I mean you've done, done it and done it well what is, and this is a hard one for a lot of you, what is that one moment that stands out that this was the moment that was like, you know, I know there are a lot of great ones, but that mm -hmm. moment that was uh, the moment that you would remember forever? Standing on the podium in Sydney, Australia with my USA uniform on, getting a gold medal pulled, put around my neck, and then, you know, and then ultimately just afterwards turning and, and out of the 15,000 people that were there, you know, identifying my parents and my grandparents and, you know, the, the significant people that were in my life uh, that were there to support me. I was really blessed to have 12 people from my family that traveled over to Sydney and, you know, and all that hard work, all those years of commitment and dedication really is a reflection of them because they helped me they helped me do it. They helped me achieve my dream. I've never had anyone bring that up, so I've never really thought about that, having your family members come with you. That's a new insight for me. So um, is that a lot for the average person's family, 12? Would you say that was like oh. everybody's going, man, your whole crew's here. <laughs> or were they going, or are you going, oh, I'm just kind of average? Well, you know, that's a lot of people to be able to travel from Texas all the way to Sydney, Australia. You know, it's a lot but of money. But we're used to traveling in Texas. It's a big state. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but it was a, it was a journey for them, um, but the day that I made the team, they were committed to find a way to get there too, and because uh, they knew how important it was to me to have them in stands, and so no doubt, I never thought for a second that they wouldn't be there, and there's not a minute of, that they would have changed their minds not to be, so, you know, um, I, I think I'm blessed to have 
12 people go with me because obviously there were some that, you know, were just lucky to have one or two to be able to afford to go do something like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a lot, but it, it definitely means the world to, uh, to us as athletes to be able to look up in the stands. And, and I think that that's significant to our athletes today that are playing, you know, at whatever level is to have somebody there that's really, you know, behind them to help stay committed to get to whatever level that it is that they want to be. Good. Well, I appreciate you taking the time for my audience to come on for us, and thank you very much. Looking for a softball bat? Do you want to say $30? Softballjunk.com is offering an additional $30 discount on all regular price bats on the website. That's right, $30 discount. Just text the word FASTPITCH to 555-888, and Gary will send you a discount code good for $30 off your next softball bat at softballjunk.com. FYI, that code's also good at the Arlington, Texas store. <clears throat> Welcome back. Now that last short clip, that was my daughter Amanda and she was telling you about my website, softballjunk.com. Make sure you text the word FASTPITCH to 555-888 and get your discount code for $30 off your next softball bat. You can use that code at checkout and like I said, save yourself $30. And you can use that code over and over and over. It's really a great deal. You just need to text FASTPITCH to 555-888 and I'll send you the discount code back to you as a text. Now if you enjoy this show, I ask you at least check out my website, softballjunk.com, the next time you're looking for softball equipment. If I offer a competitive price, well, how about buy from me and it shows some support for all the free content I bring you week after week after week. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Jennifer. Please tell your friends about the Fast Pitch TV show and make sure and check out the website at fastpitch.tv. So until next time, this is your host, Gary Leland, saying goodbye and thanks for watching. This show is a member of the Fast Pitch TV Network. See all of our shows and blogs at www.fastpitch.tv.